Hey, I'm Brett. Hey, I'm Dennis. And this is audio. Unleashed. It's the first time we've done that on camera. <laughs> it's true. So, Dennis, why are we here on YouTube today? We are here today because uh, for episode 37 of the podcast, we created an AI podcast segment. Basically, um, we did a story about this Google Notebook LM, which is a multimodal language model, which will allow you to upload a research paper and the neural network will analyze the research paper understand it to the point to where it can summarize it so you can chat mm -hmm. with a bot and go hey like explain to me what's going on here what is this research really about but it'll also let you generate a podcast with two ai hosts a male and female host basically having a conversation about what the research is about what the takeaways were and we wanted to basically share that entire podcast with everybody but not in the context of our podcast so we're making a video about it yeah good i'm excited to but there's no there's no video content in this, right? No, there. Well, I made a video. I just like did a background and did some wiggly things. So, but yeah, right. there's some there's video. Not like a, there's not like an AI generated actor. No, 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 okay. no. I just did a background for it. So why why did you so you could choose like a man and a woman to be the hosts? No, no, no. The the the, the notebook always does that. It has a male and female host, so you don't get to okay. pick that. You know, there's not a lot that you actually get to pick. I mean, a lot of it is sort of black boxy kind of stuff. But everyone will know it's fake because any audiophile podcast has to be two dudes. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I don't think they designed this thing for audiophile purposes, although they use the word audiophile a lot in the one that I did on Dr. Yeah. Tools research, but we're not sharing that one. So, um, but yeah, I think this is more for people to basically, here's the science paper. I don't really understand it. Let me have an AI explain it to me. But I think given the tools and how they work, a lot of people are going to be generating podcasts with this stuff, just sort of flooding the market, you know, anything to make a quick buck. So. Yeah, yeah, I mean, especially especially given how well it seems to work and how low the barrier to entry is. It's like any any idiot can put out a podcast now. You don't you no longer <laughs> need two idiots to do it. Just one <laughs> idiot to do the podcast. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Anyway, we've gobble gobbled enough, man. You want to just let uh, let people listen to this thing and judge for themselves? Yeah, here it is. All right. And for a full commentary, check out episode thirty seven, which we haven't named yet. So, but it'll be up soon. Bye, everybody. Bye. Ever notice how your friend's headphones, like the ones they swear by, sound kind of terrible to you? Yeah, it's one of those things, right? Makes you wonder what's going on. Totally. And it turns out there's actual research on this. It's not just like brand loyalty or whatever. It's how our ears are wired. It's true. And it gets pretty fascinating. We're looking at a 2019 paper from the Audio Engineering Society, and they dug deep. Oh, the AES. Okay, so this is legit audio science, not just someone's opinion. Absolutely. They really got into how we perceive sound, specifically with headphones. They didn't just study the headphones, they categorized listeners too. Wait, hold up. You're saying there are scientifically identified types of headphone listeners? There are. And it all starts with something called the Harmon target curve. Okay, I've heard of that. But to be honest, I'm a little fuzzy on what it actually is. Well, it's actually pretty simple. Think of it like the ideal sound profile, at least according to most people's ears. So not like a brand of headphones, but more like a measurement, like how much of each frequency is there in the sound? Exactly. It's a specific frequency response that research has shown most people find naturally pleasing. Ah, I get it. So it's like a neutral starting point they use to compare everything else against. Exactly. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. So how did they use this curve to like figure out there are these different listening types? They had people listen through a bunch of different headphones, right? But the key was measuring how much those headphone sound profiles differed from that neutral target curve. Gotcha. So some headphones would be closer to the Harman curve, others way off, and they saw how people reacted. Exactly. And what they found was that people's preferences weren't random. There were definitely patterns in how much they liked to stray or not stray from that baseline. Okay, now I'm hooked. We've got this ideal curve. We've got different headphones deviating from it. Give me the good stuff. What are the categories of headphone listeners out there? Well, they discovered three distinct classes of listeners, each with a pretty clear preference for how their sound should be shaped. Before I tell you what they are, which group do you think you might be in? Hmm. Putting me on the spot, huh? Well, if I had to guess, 
I think I'd be closest to that Harmon curve you mentioned. A safe bet for sure. Yeah, I like a balance sound. I mean, I don't mind a little bass, but nothing too crazy. Makes sense. You definitely fit right into the biggest group they found. They called them, wait for it, the Harmon Target Lovers. Huh. Okay, that's fair. Not the most creative name, but I get it. What about the other two groups? They must be the ones who like to mix things up a bit. You got it. The next group, they're all about that bass. They dubbed them the More Bases Better crowd. Okay, that's pretty self-explanatory. It is, right. And then on the flip side, we've got the Less Bass is Better listeners. They want that crisp, clean sound. So like all of it, the vocals and the higher frequencies. Exactly. But here's where it gets interesting. It wasn't just about how much bass people liked or didn't like. Oh, really? There's more to it than that. You're speaking my language. Give me the details. So one of the things they found was it wasn't all about age. You'd think, oh, younger people want more bass, older people want less. Right, like a natural progression as your hearing changes. Yeah, but it wasn't that straightforward. In fact, they found some pretty unexpected demographic links. Okay, I love when research throws a curveball like that. Tell me everything. For example, you'd think the more bass group would be like, all teenagers, right? <laughs> yeah, blasting the music, shaking the walls. Exactly. But surprisingly, this group actually leaned more towards men and, get this, trained listeners. Whoa, really? That's wild. You'd think people with more musical training would be all about that neutral Harmon curve. It is surprising. Makes you think maybe there's more to bass preference than just wanting it loud. Maybe trained ears actually pick up on more of the subtleties down there. That's a really good point. Okay, now I'm extra curious about the Les Bays group. Mm. Who were they? So this group actually did line up a little more with what you might expect. More untrained listeners fell into this category, with more women and older participants. Okay, so maybe age-related hearing loss does play a role there. Makes sense. It definitely could be a factor. But here's the thing. Even taking hearing loss into account, a lot of people in this group, they just genuinely preferred that clearer sound. Less fatiguing to the ears, you know? I, I get it. It's like the difference between, I don't know, a symphony orchestra and a rock concert. Both amazing, but totally different experiences. Perfect analogy. And that's what makes this research so fascinating. It really highlights the subjectivity of all this. It's not just about what you can hear. It's about what sounds good to you, right? Absolutely. And it gets even cooler when you dive into the specifics of what each group loved and hated within their sound profiles. Oh, now you're really teasing me. Lay it on me. What were these nuanced preferences within each group? All right, let's get into it. We've got our three listener groups, the Harmon Crew, the Bass Fanatics, and the Crisp and Clean Gang. But what did they actually prefer within those groups? What did their ideal sound profiles really look like? Okay, so starting with our Harmon target lovers, since you're a part of the club. Yeah, I feel seen. Right. They generally stuck pretty close to that neutral curve, little tweaks here and there, maybe a, a touch more emphasis in a certain range, but overall balance was key. So it's all about hearing the music as the artist intended it, no extra colorization, just pure sound. That's a great way to put it. It's about letting all the elements shine through equally, no one frequency range stealing the show. Makes sense. Okay, so what about the bass heads? We know they like it low, but what kind of low are we talking about? Yeah. All right, so the more bass is better, folks. They wanted that low end boosted by a solid three to six decibels compared to the Harmon curve, especially below 300 hertz. So that's that chest thumping bass, the kind you really feel more than just hear. Exactly. But here's the catch. They didn't actually like it when the bass dropped off too steeply below 100 hertz. Oh, interesting. So there's a sweet spot for them, even within the bass frequencies. It's not just about cranking it up to 11. Okay, how about the less bass folks? Just the opposite. Pretty much. They like those sub 100 hertz frequencies dialed way back, dipping even lower than what the Harmon target suggests. Fascinating. Yeah. So we've got these really specific preferences, even within the big picture categories. But you mentioned earlier that the researchers didn't just identify the groups. They tried to use this information to, like, predict what headphones someone would prefer, right? How did that work out? Yeah. They actually looked at the actual frequency response measurements of different headphones to see if they could match those to people's tastes. So like just by looking at the shape of a sound wave, they could say, okay, this person's going to love these headphones. That was the goal. And get this, for the Harmon target and less bass groups, it worked really well. No way. The science is real. It is, but here's the kicker. Yeah. It didn't work nearly as well for our bass-loving friends. Really? So their taste was harder to predict, even though we know they crave that low end. What's up with that? 
It's true, and that's where things get really interesting. It suggests that for the more bass listeners, there's something else going on beyond just the pure acoustics. Like an emotional connection. I mean, I know I have certain songs that just hit different because of the memories I associate with them. Exactly. Or maybe it's the physical sensation of the bass frequencies. It's more than just what you hear, it's how it makes you feel. So what's the takeaway for our listeners? How can they use this info to, you know, up their headphone game? Well, the biggest thing is there's no right or wrong answer here. Your ears are unique, and now you know there's a whole science behind why you gravitate towards certain sounds. It's like having a superpower, and you can use it to pick the perfect headphones for your own sonic fingerprint. Exactly. Like, if you're a Harman Target fan, look for headphones that are marketed as neutral or balanced. Less bass listeners might prioritize detail and clarity, looking at brands known for their mid-range and treble. It's like having a cheat sheet for headphone shopping. Totally. And for our more bass crew, since your preferences are a bit harder to pin down, don't be afraid to experiment. Figure out what kind of bass gets you going. So a journey of sonic self-discovery. I like it. That's the spirit. No matter what your ear type is, the coolest thing is just paying attention to what sounds good to you and why, because that's the first step to really, truly appreciating the power of music. Couldn't said it better myself. Until next time, keep those ears curious.